feet sing with us, you are great. Oh, you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You are great. You do miracles so
Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise tonight. Man, let's go, to Lord, in prayer tonight. Father God, we thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord. Lord, you're so good to us, day in and day out. And God, we thank you that we don't walk this world alone, but Lord, that you walk every step with us. You order the steps of a righteous man and woman. We thank you for that tonight. God, we thank you to never leave us nor forsake us, God. That you provide our needs, God. You heal our bodies, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you forgive our sins. We thank you for that. And God, we just pray tonight, Lord, that you be with us. God, we thank you that you are a comfort in a difficult time. Lord, for those that have lost loved ones, God, we pray that you would touch their hearts as only you can. Lord, you can bind up our hearts in the hurts, God. And we thank you for that tonight. Lord, we pray for our sick, God, those in the hospital. Lord, we pray that you would be with them in a mighty and a powerful way. Lord, that your healing hand would be upon them, God. That you would comfort those that are around them, Lord, the caretakers around them, God. We ask, Lord, that you would be with them and strengthen them, God. Lord, be with us as a church as we come together tonight to worship you, Lord, that we put you first, God, before all things, Lord, that we worship you and lift your name on high, God, that you are our all in all. We have our being in you, God, and we thank you for that tonight. So, God, we pray that you would be with us tonight as we worship you, Lord, as we open up your word, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us understanding, God, that you would give us vision and clarity, Lord, that you would just speak to us, God, as only you can, Lord. And, Lord, we thank you once again. We thank you for the church, God. We thank you for the family that we are, and God, God, we just pray that you would be with us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You may be seated tonight. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of God tonight. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're glad to be here tonight. We, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and get started in here in a second. We'll go ahead and take up an offering. I see my ushers are ready and waiting. And so we'll go ahead and take our offering up tonight and then we'll we'll go ahead and get in the word amen all right let's go ahead and pray over our offering tonight father god we thank you for your goodness god that you are worthy lord and we just ask that you would would be with us tonight god as we give tonight lord we pray that you bless the gift and the giver and it's in jesus name we pray amen Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansion bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us when we all get to that good that was good I like that amen Amen. a little victory in the house tonight all right all right we are in Genesis chapter 4 we've been all over the place we are we are in Genesis chapter 4 now I want to remind y'all after the fall and all those things that had happened in chapter 3 that God made a promise Adam and Eve, he said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Um, that was a promise to mankind that there would be 
uh, victory. Amen. That there would be victory over the evil one. And so we're, we're excited about that. Now I want to go ahead and get into chapter 4 because I believe that, that um, Eve believed that victory was coming through this child that she was going to bear. You know, I mean, we don't know when God's going to fulfill a promise, right? I mean, see, that's the thing about it. We know the promise is there, but we don't ever know for sure when God's going to move or how he's going to move or how soon he's going to move. You know, we believe in answered prayer, and we've seen a lot of answered prayer in our church and our church family and in our lives. But you don't ever know, like, how fast is God going to move? When's he going to answer? You know, is it going to be the first time, the second time, the third time? You know, is it before you ever ask? You know, I mean, is it after you gave up? I mean, you know, all these things, we don't, we don't know. So I want you to think about this mindset when we start looking at, um, at uh, chapter 4 in Genesis. It says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. And so, uh, you know, I want, want to talk about that for a second. I believe that she was thinking that this was the one. This was the one that was going to fulfill the promise. This was going to be the child. Now, I want to remind you of a motif that seems to go through the book of Genesis. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it seems like the younger, or I should I say the older brothers always seem to serve the younger brothers in the book of Genesis. I mean, there's a very a whole bunch of examples. We can go down through that. It's like something that runs through the book of Genesis. I'm not sure why. But, but it seems like that it's the younger, you know, it's kind of like Jacob, that old heel grabber, you know, when he was coming out. I mean, that, that, that he was going to be the, the, the one that was ahead of his, his older brother. So here you have Cain that was born um, from Eve, and she said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. I mean, she just felt, I think she felt in her spirit that, that you know, this is going to be reversed. But remember this, that sin has repercussions that we have no earthly idea I mean, you don't know how far it goes out. Sin is a lot like ripples in a pond. I don't know if you all stood out there on a nice calm day sometime and you chunk your rock out in the middle of that pond. But those ripples, before it's over with, will absolutely touch every bit of that whole pond. They'll spread out, and they may be real small when they finally get out at the very edge, but they touch everything. Sin affects everything in our lives, and it affects everyone around us. And, I, and that's what I want to stress for just a second is that, that there's, there's things that happen. It seems like it's always the innocent ones that suffer the consequences. It's always the ones, the guilty ones a lot of times are not the ones that, that suffer the consequences as much as the, the innocent ones around them bear the, the brunt of things. So Adam knew his wife, he, she conceived and bore Cain and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. And then she bore a Again, and this time his brother Abel. Now, I want you to say a little bit about Abel, that name. The derivation of the name Abel is, is, the, is the same word as, that was used as vanity or a vapor in the book of Ecclesiastes. When things, you know, um, they were all vanity. It was things that were just going to, you know, not last that long. So I want you to understand that, that in, the, in the Bible, a lot of times names have a lot to do with what's going to happen in someone's life or how long they're going to last or whatever. So you have, have Abel who was just going to be kind of like a vapor of vanity. It says, now Abel, Abel was a keeper of the, of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Um, both of them absolutely honorable in what they're doing. I want you to think about that for a second because Adam, he was, he was supposed to tend the garden. He was the gardener. He was the one that was going to take care of that. Now, of course, they fell, and, and now he was going to have to make his livelihood from the sweat of his brow, and, and the ground was going to return briars and different things, but, but yet that was his livelihood was going to come from the ground. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. He was a shepherd, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass. So see, some time has passed now. This is not like it just five minutes have gone by or something. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. So they've, somehow they've been instructed at some point or another to bring offerings to God. 
Um, each and every one of us, we're supposed to bring offerings to God. Now, we may not bring things like fruit or animals or whatever now, but we're supposed to bring ourselves as an offering to God. What we do is an offering to God. We're supposed to give the first fruit of our life as an offering for God. Um, those things that are supposed to happen. So in the process of time, it came to pass. Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground of the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And it tells us this, and it says, The Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. This is one of those gigantic theological questions. Why was Cain's offering refused and Abel's offering accepted? And there's all kinds of theories and different things um, about that. I, I will say this, that that it matters how you bring your offering to the Lord. It matters what you offer to the Lord. I was reading in one of the commentaries, you know, and they always have little, little funny little stories or whatever. And they had one to where this one woman had called a butterball turkey representative. Have you heard this, Mr. James? I don't know if you, you can imagine, right? So she calls the butterball turkey representative. And she says, um, I've had a frozen turkey in my freezer for 23 years. And she said, you think it's still good? And he said, well, ma'am, he said, as long as it stayed frozen and it's not ever thawed out or whatever, he said, it is probably still good, but it would probably absolutely taste horrendous. I mean, it, you know, it's freezer burned. I mean, it's, it's not going to be. Any. And she said, okay, well, in that case, I'll give it to the church. <laughs> now, I know that that's, you know. It's a joke, right? But, but it matters what we give to God. Do you give the best that you've got, the first fruit? And I'm not talking about, you know, um, amounts and different things because the widow gave her might and you know that little tiny bit that she had and that was greater than all the riches that were poured in the treasury that day I mean it's not the amount it's the intent and it's it's what you've given have you given God the best that you have you know because because that's the important thing with an offering is is it the best it, it tells us here that that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock, the firstborn, the very best, the best that he had, the first fruit he brought. Now you see, you notice here that Cain brought an offering of the fruit. So, you know, what fruit did he bring him? He bring him the first fruit, he bring him the best fruit, he bring him the worst fruit, he bring him the fruit that fell on the ground. What did he bring him? You know, you see, there's a there's definitely a distinction there. And if you if you really want to dig deeper, why you can start looking in other places in the Bible and look in the book of Hebrews in different places and see what they say about Abel's offering. Abel offered his offering in faith. He was faithful in what he did. It meant something to him. Cain, I don't believe that he had a, had a heart for worship. You know, See, here's the thing, and, and this is something that I want you to understand. You, know, you can come to church on Sunday, and your offering of your presence may not be acceptable to God. You say, well, what, do you, what do you mean? Well, what I'm saying is, is that are you here... To worship God? Have you come to where you've, 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 you've cleared yourself in such a way that you're going to give God the best first fruit, your best offering, your best worship, your best attentiveness, your best that you've not, you know, come in the door with all these other things going on, that you have come to worship God, or have you come in just because that's what's expected? See, I believe that, that Cain, you know, it was expected to bring God an offering of what he had. So he just brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel brought the firstborn and the, of his flock and their fat. The Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Another way that we could look at all these things is that, is that generally an offering had to have bloodshed. In order for sin, for remission of sin, something had to die 
in order for sin to be forgiven or remit, well, not so much forgiven, but, but be covered by the offering, okay? See, that was the way it worked in the Old Testament. That if you wanted to cover something like that, you had to cover it with blood. Adam and Eve, after they first sinned, they covered themselves with fig leaves. And God actually killed some animals and covered them with skin to cover them properly, to cover their sin. See, blood, the shedding of blood has a lot to do with this. So that could be another thing. You know, maybe they were supposed to bring of the flock. You know, maybe that was supposed to be the right offering. I don't know what the right answer is. I know that Abel offered in faith and Cain offered whatever. The Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. I want you to understand something. When you start getting angry with God, you're in a dangerous place. See, people, people get angry with God sometimes about things. And, and, they, and they, they, they start putting up walls, and they, and they start doing things. And, and see, that's a, that's a dangerous place to be. It, it's one thing to, to you know, be upset about things, but, but there comes a point in time where you've got to release, and you've got to allow you know, God to be God, and we be the people, and, and we do that. But Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So listen to this. I want you to see, see what kind of God we serve. So the Lord says to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Well, see, once again, it's one of those questions where don't you think that God knew why he was angry? I mean, it's like when he asked Adam and Eve, where are you? Well, he knew where they were. I mean, they're in the garden. I mean, they're hiding out from them in the trees. But he knows they're right. Where are you? Yeah, I'm God. I know where everybody is. I, I know exactly what, what you've done. I know everything about what's happened. So, so now he's speaking to Cain you know, why are you, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? See, God always approaches us with grace. See, God always gives us the opportunity to get ourselves right with him. That's why he's asking questions. He's asking so that, so that, that Cain can get himself straight with God. You ever get in those situations where God kind of gives you a pause and you got you to gotta kind of answer to God about a certain thing and it gives you that time to find out well maybe I had wrong motivation maybe this well why am I angry well I'm angry because you took Abel's offering and you didn't take mine you know why why was his better than mine God well then of course he's got to examine himself and and wonder well what was the problem with his offering you know, was it not the best that he had to give God? Was it just scraps? Was he supposed to give in a certain way? Because there was obviously, they had been giving offerings, or they wouldn't be speaking of, of they just didn't wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to make an offering to God. I mean, this was something that, that they had been doing. So it gives them the opportunity to examine themselves. Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? Then God tells him this. If you do well, Will you not be accepted? See, that's the thing. That's God. That's God saying, look, you know, I don't care what path you're on right now, but, but if you'll do as you know you should do and as you know as I've commanded you to do, then you will be accepted by me. Do, just do what I ask you and you'll be accepted. But he says, and if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. You know, every time I read that, I think of like a dog laying there or something, you know, right there at the door. I don't know if y'all ever had dogs where they laid right at the door, you know, and, and, and every time you came home and, or you went out or whatever, the dog was right there to meet you. I mean, the dog was there. It was absolutely there. Well, if you don't do well, sin's lying at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. See, see, I want you to understand something. That any time you, you say that the devil made you do it, well, that's not true. That's a lie. Sin lies at the door, but it's up to you to rule over the sin. It's up to you to go ahead and make the right decisions, to make the right choice. You know, there are times where when we get put in a situation to where there's times where we just need to back away and walk away. There's times where when we get mad that we don't even need to speak to somebody for two days. Y'all sitting there saying, hmm. No, there's times where you, don't, you just don't need to speak. If they've made you that mad, the best thing for you to do is shut your mouth and wait a couple days and cool off and then go ahead and deal with it then with a cool mind. Because you see, if you speak out of anger, then generally what happens is you make a fool out of yourself. So God says to him, he says, look, 
If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. See, and that's the thing that we need to understand, each and every one of us, that we've always got to make sure that we stay in touch with the Lord, that we're walking in the, in the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is supposed to lead us, guide us, and direct us in everything that we do. We, His power and His Spirit should be present and working in each one of us all the time. See, He doesn't shut off. What happens is we shut Him off. We shut him out. We push him aside. We quit listening to the prompting of the Spirit. And the matter you get, the deafer you get to the Spirit of God. I can tell you from experience, I promise you, you get mad, you quit hearing from God, and you start hearing from the flesh. Flesh wants to, oh, man, I'm going to let him hold it. Right? And it makes you feel good. Oh, boy, I feel great for about 30 seconds. And then you're like, ooh. Man, that wasn't good at all. And then you got to repent and get, get past that. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, God has tried to give Cain a cooling off period. He's tried to give him every opportunity to get himself straight, to get himself right, to deal with the situation, to do what he needs to do. And I can tell you from experience also that there's been many times where God has tried to get my attention in a situation over and over and over and over again, and I was just bound and determined I was going to do it my way and not God's way, and I plunder on through. And it never ended well. So what happens? Verse 8, Cain talked with Abel his brother. And when it came to pass, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Now I want you to think about this for a second. The very first two brothers mentioned in the Bible, and one of them kills the other one. I mean. People have been a mess since the very beginning. And when you see stuff today and you say, I can't believe that. Well, I can. Because if Cain could kill his brother, first thing, I mean, I, you know, it just absolutely amazes me that that, that that kind of hatred, that that kind of jealousy, that that kind of whatever it was, was bottled up in him. And God knew that he was going down that path. And he's asking him, why are you angry? Why is your countenance foul? If you'll just do well, you'll be accepted. And, and, you know, sin lies at the door. And it's desires for you, but you should rule over it. But Cain talks with Abel. I don't know if he lured him out into the field or what he did. But this was absolutely premeditated murder. This wasn't like, oh, well, they got, you know, into a confrontation or something. It was, it was, this was premeditated. Cain talked to him, said, hey, man, come on out in the field, or, you know, whatever. And, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Wow. You never know what you're capable of sometimes, Right? I, I remember that old saying, except for the grace of God, there go I. Right? See, we, we you know a lot of times we're quick to judge, we're quick to point a finger, we're quick to do this and that. And you ever, but, man, I'm telling you, all through the Bible, you see people that, that they, they had a choice to make and they made the wrong choice. And, and I wonder sometimes maybe that God put that in there to try to teach us. You know, along the way, try to teach us that, look, if you're angry, what you need to do is you need to get yourself in check first before you move forward. If you're angry, you need to deal with it in such a way. You need to handle with these things. You need to be constructive about stuff because, see, sin lies at the door. Sin is always there. Sin's always there. I mean, it's the personification of sin. It's like that dog that lies at the door waiting for you every time you come in and every time you go out. It's right there waiting. And unless we live our lives under the, under the influence and power of the Holy Spirit of God, we got no chance. I mean, honestly, we've got no chance without God. No chance whatsoever. None of us are, are good enough. None of us are, are smart enough. None of us are, 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 have enough willpower. None of us have any of those things. And without God, we'll fail. And we need to know that. So, once again, God speaks. The Lord said to Cain, Where's Abel, your brother? 
You don't think God knew what happened? He's given him the opportunity to repent, to ask forgiveness. See, God has been graceful from beginning to end through the Bible. It's always been grace. It's always been love. There's always been mercy. God's always pulled it out to where, you know, if you really want to be forgiven, if you really want to be cleansed, if you really want to be set free, if you really want to want to drop all your burdens, then God will, he'll, he'll carry your burdens. He'll take that. But you've got to give it to him. And when God comes up to you, it's just like blind Bartimaeus when he was on the side of the, the trail uh, begging, you know, and crying out to God and everything. And when he finally got Jesus stopped and Jesus called him to him, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And so Bartimaeus had to tell him what he needed. What he needed was his sight restored. I don't want to be a beggar anymore. I don't want to lie on the side of the road. I don't have to depend on everybody else. I want to be healed. I want to be able to see. I want to be able to work. I want to be able to be like everybody else. He told Jesus exactly what he needed. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He could have said, oh man, you just don't know. I've killed my brother. I'm, I'm, I'm broken hearted. This is absolutely just tearing me apart. I've got to, man, you know. But what's he say? So I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The world's most famous question, right? Am I my brother's keeper? See, as hard as we can, we try to decide, first of all, who's my brother? Right? I mean, really, we try to, we try to decide who's my brother who's my sister who do I have to you know reach out to what do I have to do and how do I have to do it you know am I my brother's keeper well the first thing is, is well who's your brother well you know I mean see we, we some people have real narrow and some have have wider um, I believe that that every one of us has has some uh, we have a responsibility to one another in this world and see, it's getting less and less. People really don't care about each other much anymore. I mean, honestly, I mean, it's really getting to where in the church it's not so bad. You know, we, we love one another and we look after one another and we, we try to do the best we can for each other here. We're, we do really good. But if you get outside of the church and you get into unchurched people and you get into places where, where there's no church uh, whatsoever, no Jesus, no Holy Spirit, none of that, and you really start to see how mean people can get. I mean, you can see people that, that, that can be broke down or, or something happening on the side of the road and nobody will stop. Nobody will help them. Nobody will do anything for them. And, and I've even been guilty of stuff like that. I was kind of like, you know, the good Samaritan where everybody seemed like they walked by the poor fellow laying on the side of the road beat up. And one of them that walked by, a matter of fact, I think he went on the other side of the road or whatever, was a priest. Well, I was kind of that priest one day. I was going to a denominational meeting. You know how exciting those are. And uh, so I was kind of running late. And I was, I was going the back way up to, up to Greensboro. And uh, looked over and I saw a woman on the side of the road. And looked like she had a few kids out there. And they had a flat tire. And I, and I looked over and I just kind of looked and just kept on riding. And my wife told me, she said, Rick, aren't you going to stop and help that woman? I said, baby, we got to get to this meeting. I'm late. She said, aren't you going to stop and help this woman? Yeah, you know what happened, right? <laughs> I put the brakes on, turned around, <laughs> and went back, changed her tire. All she had was one of them little teeny tiny donut things. Had three little kids with her. We get into Lillington. We got someplace where we could get a, a used tire. I went. Paid for the woman to get herself a tire and went to my meeting late. But what was more pleasing to God? Me fixing that woman's tire or me getting to my little meeting late? Well, of course, the meeting didn't matter a thing in the world. That wasn't what it was about. It was about helping this woman. I remember another time where a lady come to me. I just bought a brand new pickup truck. When the Titans first came out, 2004, I bought one brand new, man. I drove one one time. The very first year they came out, you don't never buy anything the first year it comes out, right? 
That's right, right? Because they're all full of mess. Mr. Ronnie probably tell you about that. Don't ever buy a vehicle the first year to make them because they ain't worked all the bugs out yet. Well, I loved it so good, I'm buying this thing, man, and I bought that truck. I still have the truck. I loved that truck. I had a girl come up to me. She needed to borrow a vehicle to go down to Clinton to sign up for some help for her and her, her child. She had a little baby that she had still in the car seat and everything. Well, I had an old pickup truck that I used for work. The seat was broke and everything else. And, um, so I was more than happy and willing to let her use my old F-250 that it took like three football fields to turn around, seat broke, everything else. And, have to, and it didn't have like four doors like they do now. It had two doors, and you had to open the door, and then you had to slide the seat all the way forward, kick it up, and put the baby seat in the back and all that stuff. And, you know... I was perfectly content with letting her borrow that old truck. And the Lord whooped me. You know what he asked me? He said, who do you love more, Rick? That truck or that girl and that baby? And I'll be quite honest now. It was a brand new truck. <laughs> and I loved that truck. Man, I love that truck. I said, Lord, I love that woman and that child more. I love that truck. He said, so why are you sending me in your work truck? Let her take your truck. So I did. Am I my brother's keeper? Best I can. And there's times where you say no. I know that. We can't say yes to everything. If everybody said yes to everything, nobody would have anything. But we need to understand that we're responsible one to another. Lord said to Cain, where's Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? Once again, see, see, once again, I mean, God keeps trying over and over and over again to get him to confess what he's done. He said, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The blood's crying out. I want you to think about that for a second. I mean, you know, all he's got to do is tell God what he's done. Verse 11, so now you're cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Hmm. And see, I think this is even worse than the first time around with Adam. Because now he tells them, when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. So, of course, Cain says to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you've driven me out this day from the face of the ground, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. I want you to notice something here. Not one place, not one place, Man, I feel bad for killing my brother. Not one place, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have killed my brother. Not one place. Not one single place there. Nothing. What's Cain complain about? My punishment is greater than I can bear. See, a lot of folks, they're not upset about sin and its consequences in their lives. All they're upset about is when they get caught and there's consequences for the sin. You see, people are more upset about the consequences than the actual sin. See, that, that's, a, that's a problem. I mean, because America is full of it. The people are scared to death of the consequences. They'll just sin and sin and sin. But then when they get caught in the consequence, then they're like, oh, my punishment is more than I can bear. Surely you've driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. He's, he's like, you know, you've kicked me out, God. I'm going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. And then he says, and then this is what gets me. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. 
Well, look, you just killed your brother. And now you're worried because somebody else might come and kill you. You know what do they say? It's good for the goose, it's good for the gander, right? I mean, you know, I, I'm, it's absolutely messed up thinking. And, and when we start reading Genesis, because everybody says, oh, well, the Bible, it doesn't apply to the world anymore. It doesn't apply to America. It, doesn't apply to, it applies perfectly to America. Look at the society today that we live in. Nobody wants to take responsibility for anything. They want to blame everything on somebody else. There's a whole victim mentality that people are all victims. I'm here to tell you, you'll never have victory as long as you live your life as a victim. And that's the truth. If every time you turn around, you're the victim of someone, you will never have victory. Sooner or later, you got to step back and you got to, you got to just own up and you got to move on forward and you got to go ahead and say, you know what, I'm, I'm in a mess, but, but God's going to take me through to the other side and I know that, that I'm going to have victory in Him. That you got to realize, quit blaming this one over there and that one over there and that one over there. All the time, I hear that all the time from people that they quit going to church. I've quit going to church. I said, why have you quit going to church? Oh, because those people there, there's hypocrites there and somebody said something to me and they looked funny at me and this and that and the other and everything else and I'm not going to church no more. Well, the problem is, is that the only one you're hurting when you don't go to church is you. Because, see, the most important relationship you have is between you and God. Look, it doesn't matter. You could sit in a whole church full of hypocrites, Right? But if you're there to worship God and you're singly focused upon Him, the preacher can be an absolute nutcase, kind of like the one y'all got and all that stuff, right? Amen. That's right. That's the first amen I got tonight. Amen. But the thing is, is that it's not the reason we're there. There was a church of two. Cain brought an offering. Abel brought the first born. Abel had church. And Cain didn't. There was only two. So I mean, I want you to think about that. When we come to church, you know, why are you here? Because it's important. Motivation. Why are you here? Are you here to worship God? Because that's what we're supposed to be here for. Worship the Lord. We're supposed to be here to be built up. We're supposed to be here to edify. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to help one another. Am I my brother's keeper? You better believe I'm my brother's keeper. I'm supposed to be my brother's keeper. That's what I do. I'm supposed to love God, neighbors, and saving souls. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we're, that's what we're about. Yes, I'm my brother's keeper. I don't want my brother to die and go to hell. I don't want that for him because I know what that is. I, Because, see, I, I'm, I'm, I understand. I've read the Word of God. I understand. I don't want anybody to go there. Cain, he never owns up to anything. So the Lord says to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. The Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. We're trying to figure out what the mark is. I don't know. I can't find it. You know what was really funny about this whole thing when I started doing a little bit of research about all this stuff? You know how I was talking when the, when the Lord told him, he said, if you don't do well, sin lies at the door. And I said it was a lot like a dog. Well, you know what they, some of the commentators say was the mark to tell who Cain was? Because he had a certain dog that went with him. Everywhere he went. Now this is Jewish. This is not, you know, it's not out of there. This is the Jews. They, they had a whole bunch of stuff that they kind of added on to things. But that was their thing, was that there was a dog that went with him. Now I want you to understand what Jews thought of dogs. Americans, we love dogs, right? Everybody's got dogs. I got a new puppy that's about to worry me to death still. It's three months old, and I'm praying that she's going to be a year soon. Whew. We love dogs. The Jews hated dogs. I mean, when they talked about people they didn't like, they called them dogs. They hated them. Matter of fact, when the, when the, the was it the Syrophoenician woman, right? Call her a dog. 
dogs. They hated dogs. So one of the things that, that they said in the commentary was that possibly Cain had this dog that accompanied him everywhere he went. And that's how they knew who he was. In 16, it says, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Nod means wandering. It means a wandering place. He was wandering all around. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city, and they named the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad bought, uh, uh, begot Mahujael, and Mahujael bought, begot Methushael, and Methushael begot Lamech. All those good Samson County names that we got in the Bible here. Lamech. Now listen to this. See, see, now this is the family of Cain, right? So see, I want you to understand. The family of Cain. Okay? So what's his, his son do? Lamech took for himself two wives. Yeah, God bless him, right? Amen. There's where polygamy starts. God didn't say that you're supposed to have two wives. When they were, when it spoke of Adam and Eve, they were supposed to become one flesh. Well, how can you become one flesh when you got more than one wife or more than one husband? We can flip it around. It doesn't matter either way you want to do it. But how, how can you do that? See, see, the family of Cain started some of this mess. You know, they started these cities, and then they take two wives, and one was named Ada, and the second one was Zillah, and Ada bore Jabal, and he, the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock, and his brother's name was Jubal, and, and he was the father of all those who play the harp and a flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was, was Nama, and Lamech, Lamech said to his wives, he said, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I've killed a man for wounding me and even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Well, that's a nice thing that talks about how, how um, he was just so, so vicious that, that, you know, when he took vengeance on someone, man, he didn't play. He, 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 he did it way worse. You know, if Cain's going to be a man sevenfold, then I'm 77-fold. And I'm going to, that's how I'm going to live my life, vengefully. I mean, all these things, this whole line, this whole family line of Cain. See how sin has crept in there and that whole family. Generation after generation after generation is moving further and further and further away from God. See, and that's what happens in families today, that you get one generation after another generation after another generation, and they keep going further and further and further away. Verse 25, and Adam knew his wife again. She bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. See, I want you to understand that right there that see, see the one that they just knew they just knew that Cain was going to be the one. He was going to be the one that was going to bruise the head of the serpent. He, that was going to be the one and he wasn't the one at all. He ended up being a murderer. So God gave him another one named Seth. And as for Seth to him also a son was born and he named him Enosh. And notice this then men began to call on the name of the Lord. See, you've got a split in the family tree. you got the family of Cain going away from God as hard as they can. you got the family of Seth that are calling upon the name of the Lord. Every family... And go to the left and go to the right. The thing about it is, and this is, I'm going to go ahead and close with this. So why do you think Cain killed Abel? Was it because Adam and Eve were bad parents? See, it's kind of like that old question They asked Jesus, with the man born blind from birth, who sinned? Was it his parents or was it him? Or who, who, who sinned that this man was born blind? 
Well, who sinned that turned Cain into a murderer? See, I would caution you to be very careful to judge parents by their children. See, that's what we usually do, right? Because we look at them and we say, oh, well, I know their daddy and their mama, and obviously they're good people, or I know their daddy and their mama, and obviously I wouldn't kick a dog for them, right? Heard it both ways. Folks, that doesn't always pan out. The very first two parents, first son that they bore, was a murderer. That's the power. Of sin. Let's go ahead and, and close. If you all stand with me, we'll go ahead and close tonight. I wish I could pep this up and uh, but God has a way of writing the ship. He'll send one that will serve him. That's the way it works. He'll send one that will serve him. So as we close tonight, I just want you to just just remember that your offering to God matters. What you bring matters. Are you giving God the best that you have? Are you give him your best. Because that's what he wants. He wants the best that we have. If you're going to teach, teach as good as you can. If you're going to sing, sing like the angels. Sing with everything that you've got, every bit of your being and fiber. If you're going to worship him, man, worship him. I mean, like it really, like maybe this is the last time you're going to get to come together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Man, you know, imagine if, if we knew tomorrow we didn't get tomorrow... If we knew that this was all, everything was going to be done, this was going to be the last time that we could come together on a Wednesday night here at Stony Run Pentecostal Free Will Baptist Church, how would, you, how would you worship Him tonight? Would it just be like, well, you know, it's the last time, it's no big deal? Or would you be like, man, we are so blessed that we have one another and, and you know, and, and we're just going to worship like it's the last time. And see, the thing is, you never know when it's going to be the last time. A very wise man said, live your life like you'd like to be found on your last day. If you live like that, you won't have no regrets. You'll be exactly as you should be. Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer tonight. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. But Lord, I thank you most of all that, that you continually open the door of grace to us. Lord, you know what we've done. You know what's in our hearts and in our minds. You know our, our, our um, intentions and our thoughts. You know everything about us. And yet, God, you are so gracious to us. That, Lord, you continually open the door for us to, to approach you, God. You open the door for us to, to draw closer to you. God, you open a door for us to, to confess to you and repent to you and ask forgiveness and, and come for fellowship. And, God, you just continually over and over and over again, no matter what, where we found ourselves. Because, God, sometimes we get lost. Lord, sometimes we get off the track and we don't even know where we're at. And, and Lord, even in the midst of that, you cry out to us. To come back to you. Lord you pursue us in our lives. And God I thank you for that tonight. So God I pray that if, if we're lost tonight. Lord that we be found. God I pray that if we don't know Jesus our Savior tonight. That we would accept him as our Savior tonight. And start walking with him. God I, I pray that, that if we feel like we've committed a sin. That we can't be forgiven for. Lord that we would just open our hearts. And, and repent to you. And just ask forgiveness Lord. That we would not have to carry the burden anymore. Because, God, I know that you are faithful and you are just and you are true. And, Lord, that if we'll confess our sin to you, Lord, you are righteous and you'll forgive us all our sin and wash us from all iniquity. You'll cleanse us, God. You will wash us clean. And, Lord, I thank you for that tonight, that you're the God that we can continually come to 
Time and time and time again, Lord, you don't turn a deaf ear. You don't run from us. God, you continually invite us to you. And Lord, I I pray that we can remember that in our hearts, that when we see people in our lives around us that are lost, that don't appear to even have a shot, that we'll realize and know that you died for them too, and that those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that we need to look through your eyes at folks like that. That we might see who they really are in you. And God, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless y'all.